Greetings, guitar engineers. I'm Desi Serna, and welcome to part two of my Q&A. Uh, I recently sent out an email, and I said, hey, I'm going to answer some questions on my podcast and in my next YouTube video. Send me your questions, and I got quite a few good questions. I already released a part one. You can go back and watch that if you haven't seen it. But here uh, we have part two. So more answers to questions about music theory, guitar playing, practicing, songs, gear, uh, you name it. You can see my answers right here on YouTube. And I'm also releasing this. Um, uh, I'm going to strip this audio and put it in my podcast. So if you're watching me on YouTube, you can uh, go to wherever podcasts are found and you can search Guitar Music Theory, Desi Serna, and you can subs subscribe to my audio podcast, which is great for listening on the go. And I also sometimes release some different content on the podcast. If you're listening to the podcast, you can head, head over to the YouTube channel, Desi Serna Guitar, and you can subscribe to my YouTube channel and you can actually uh, watch this on video. And sometimes I have different content, uh, video content on YouTube. Uh, let's dive right in because I do have a lot of questions to get through. So here we go. Part two of Q&A. And this is where we pick up. Uh, the question is, here is a, uh, this person says, um, this is Bruce. By, Bruce, Bruce, uh, who uh, uh, is a Skype student. Hi, Bruce. Um, he says, here's a question that's bothered me for a long time. When soloing along with a chord progression, I hear people say, use the fourth pattern of the pen pentatonic scale during the A minor chord. It goes good with this chord, blah, 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 blah. So he says, how does one know which position works best with a chord? Um, and he's basically saying, can you explain, explain that? Okay, so if you're playing a song, if you're playing over an A minor chord, <laughs> or over a song that's in the key of A minor. Um, you could use the A minor pentatonic. And the notes of A minor pentatonic are located all over the fretboard. Um, sometimes, you know, there's only five notes in the A minor pentatonic, but you have those same five notes are located in different positions. Those are all the same notes in different positions. That's just the way it works on the fretboard. And of course, you can play in different registers as, as well. Uh, right? Or uh, different octaves and stuff. So even though there's only five notes, uh, those notes are located all over the fretboard, and they make different patterns and positions. When you're playing in the key of A minor, it does not matter what pattern or position you're in. It's all fair game. Um, there isn't any specific pattern that you must play with a specific chord shape. If I'm playing over an A minor chord, I can play the A minor pentatonic anywhere. Now, some people, if they're playing over, if they're playing an A minor chord like this as an E form bar chord, E minor form bar chord at the fifth fret, well, they might naturally gravitate to pentatonic pattern one because it's in the same position, so it's a good jumping off point. But you don't have to play that. You can play A, mi a minor pen pentatonic anywhere. Um, just like, you know, you could strum A minor chord here or an A minor chord here or a A minor chord here or. Uh, whatever. So uh, there is, again, there isn't any any rule. So I think maybe you, uh, Bruce, you might have gotten a little misled um, about that. Sometimes it makes sense to use a particular pattern, just be, be, what I said earlier, because it's a good jumping off point, you know, um, uh, you know, for the for the chord. If you're up in this position, well, then I might immediately. Think about the pentatonic pattern in that position because I'm there, but I don't have to use it. I can use A minor pentatonic anywhere. I hope that makes sense. We are going to move on. Um, this is from Edgar, and he says, any tips on playing cleaner? That is, clearer notes and less unwanted noise, especially with higher gain settings. And then he says, how do you avoid plateaus in your playing and feeling stuck? Okay, so I answered this a similar question back in part one of this uh, Q&A. And uh, uh, basically, I talked about how 
um, you have there's certain essential skills that all guitar players need to learn, and you develop those skills by playing songs, which is why I'm such a big advocate of saying learn songs and build your repertoire, learn songs with open chords and power chords and bar chords. And you know that I have some courses and instruction to help you do that. And all along the way, I'm talking about, you know, how to best finger those chords, how to transition smoothly, how to clean up your playing and control unwanted string noise. There's all sorts of subtle little techniques. And you learn those as you go and you develop them as you're playing through these songs. That's the best, that's, that's how you do it. So if you're having trouble with that, you might need to back up and work on, uh, and take a look at the instruction that I have on that, um, and slowly work on refining those skills. And those are essential skills that everybody, everybody needs. It's a problem. If you can't control unwanted string noise, if you can't tran transition between chords smoothly, then you're gonna, that's gonna be a problem and you're gonna struggle with that. And the only way to, uh, fix it is back up and work on um, playing songs, simple songs that give you an opportunity to refine those absolutely necessary skills. And you said, you know, specifically when you're playing with high gain settings, because when you're playing with high gain settings, noise just becomes more pronounced. It's more critical that you can control noise by using a combination of left hand and uh, right hand uh, muting. And you need to do exactly what I uh, tell you to do and some of my instruction particularly you could take a look at the power chord one um, because power chord shapes will typically just use two or three strings at a time and they use distortion and you got to keep all those other strings quiet so I talk about that and all of those uh, um, all of those lessons and then the other part was how do you avoid plateaus in your playing and feeling stuck I think one reason why people hit plateaus is because oftentimes I think they have gotten ahead of themselves and they think they're kind of ready to go to the next level, but they're struggling to get to that next level. And the reason why is because they have a lot more work to do before they're ready to take that step. One common problem that I see a lot is that... Uh, people are trying to fill their head with information. And then once they have filled their head with information, they think, okay, now I'm ready for more information. You need to take in a little bit of inf information, then you need to stop, and then you need to work on all the ways that that information actually gets applied in music. You know, So if you're learning power chords for the first time, you don't like memorize the power chord shape and say, okay, I'm ready to move on. You learn how to play 30 songs that use power chords. And all of those songs are going to introduce other elements of guitar playing uh, to you that you need to practice and refine. So you need to kind of spend some time on that level getting introduced to all those skills and refining your skills and building your song repertoire and so on and so forth. Then... When you say, okay, well, what's next? Oh, I'm going to move on to bar chords. Suddenly, bar chords aren't as hard anymore because your playing has improved so much and you've developed so many skills. Then you do the same thing with bar chords, you know? And then maybe after that, you start working on lead guitar techniques. But now, man, you're ha you've developed so much hand strength and dexterity. You know how to control unwanted string noise. So now those lead guitar techniques are within reach and uh, you're not struggling with you know um, uh, making that transition right I hope that makes sense so if you're plateauing maybe you need to back up and you need to refine your skills at the level you're at and that's gonna help you move uh, forward uh, next question comes from Joseph and he says which pick thickness do you prefer do you use a different pick for different styles like strumming or riffing do you have any tips for strumming with a thicker pick? I answered something similar to this in part one. And uh, I usually use, I like the Fender uh, Heavy. And then I have this Gravity guitar pick. And this is a pretty thick pick. It doesn't bend. And I have a couple different versions uh, of it. And I use different picks depending on what I think sounds best. Um, and like I already explained, uh, different picks, the thickness and the material does actually affect the tone slightly. So I listen to that and then I go by what, uh, what feels best. For beginners, um, I would probably, beginners can use like a medium pick, like a Fender medium. 
and maybe you can work toward uh, eventually over time trying a fender heavy. Um, but when you're, uh, it takes time to develop the skills necessary to um, uh, uh, to play with a thicker pick. Um, what happens is is that initially, uh, if you have a real rigid pick, it kind of makes your playing harder to do. You need something that has a little give in it because you're still developing your your your, your and refining refining your skills. So you want something that's got a little bit of give in it. Give in it. Uh, but then over time, as your skills improve, you get to the point where you don't want the pick bending on you, at least with some things. And so as, as your general playing skills improve, you can try um, a thicker pick. And then at some point, um, uh, you can you know, go with like an extra heavy pick or something, um, something like that. So that's what I would recommend. And what was the other part of your question there? Any tips on strumming with a thicker pick? Um, if you're really str struggling with you know, strumming with a, with a thicker pick, you need to go to something that's less thick and uh, work with that for a while. And once you get comfortable with that, then you can go back to the thicker pick. I oftentimes will use a, a, a thick pick. Here's an example. This is, this is uh, more sturdy than a Fender Heavy. This is a gravity guitar pick. It's made, made from some material. I like the way it sounds on an acoustic guitar, so I frequently will use it on an acoustic guitar. And even though it's thick, like you, most people think that you'd want a thinner pick for an acoustic, and sometimes that does have a nice sound. Um, but uh, I've been playing so long, and I have so much control over the pick, and you know, have developed such a um, uh, refined touch, I guess, that I had no trouble controlling uh, using a thicker pick, even while while strumming chords. If you're having trouble with that, just don't do it. Just back up and use something that's thinner, and just let yourself let your skills develop over time, and, and gradually work your way up. And you know, you don't have to use a thick pick. You might be someone that says, man, I never felt comfortable using a thick pick. There are some pro players, professional players that are like, I've never used anything beyond a Fender Heavy or a Fender Medium. There's no rule that says you have to go beyond that. Um, figure out what works best for you and, uh, and, do, and do that. All right, we are moving on. Dan says, what is the best way to keep time and to know where you are at in a song. So Dan, obviously I can tell that you're still you're a beginner, you're still struggling. You've learned the basics, but you're struggling to actually apply them and and uh uh play music. And I'm glad that you are asking this question because it's really important that you develop these skills before you move on. One of the biggest mistakes people make is they learn the basics and they say, "Okay, I got the basics. Now what? I'm going to go out and get a guitar theory book and I'm going to take things to the next level and start working on some advanced stuff." No, 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 no. Learn the basics, and then you need to spend a lot of time learning how to apply those basics to music by playing complete songs and, and focusing mainly on just the rhythm guitar parts, open chords, power chords, eventually some bar chords, strumming along with the songs like you're part of the band and staying in time with the music. So what is the best way to do that? Um, play along with songs. Choose really simple songs that are not complicated. You only have a few chords. They don't change too often. Um, you can play them with a simple strum pattern. You know, when I start Beginners Out, one of the first songs that I'll teach is Wonderful Tonight by Eric Clapton. And uh, I will have them just strum each chord once at the beginning of a measure. So they would put the song on and just go one. And so on, and we would work on following the music and just hitting that chord at the beginning of the beat and then keeping track of the rest of the beats and then changing chords on time. If you're a beginner and you've never played any songs, that's the first step you need to take. So <clears throat> maybe you're struggling because you're trying to do something beyond that and you've gotten ahead of yourself. You've got to back up and work on something simple like this. You know, over time, you can fill in with a strum, strum pattern. <laughs> maybe some picking, you know. But 
But you shouldn't be doing that right out of the gate. You got to keep it really, really simple and just develop each little skill one at a time and slowly put it together. Um, you know, Wild Thing is another song I frequently start people on. I slow the song down, you know. <laughs> got to keep it simple. Got to play along with music. If you can take some lessons uh, so someone can help you and guide you and, and, and um, you know, give you some help in those early stages, uh, you can. I actually have a free course you can take onla uh, online on my website, how to strum three simple songs. I'll show you a wonderful tonight, wild thing and smoke on the water. So follow the instruction that I give you uh, there and you will be on the right track. And we are moving on. This is Jake. This <clears throat> question, he says, I read your chapter, your fretboard theory chapter on outlining uh, chord progressions using arpeggios while soloing. That's also called uh, chord tone soloing, by the way. And he said, who would be some famous guitarists that use arpeggios in their solos? And how can I incorporate arpeggios into my style? Good question. But first, let me get a drink. Okay, so for those, uh, for those of you that don't know what chord tone soloing is, it's where instead of just playing up, in, instead of playing a scale pattern, you would think about the chord changes you're playing over, and you would play the arpeggios that correspond to those. So let's say I was playing the chords uh, A minor, G, and F. So I could play an A minor arpeggio. An arpeggio is when you play the notes of a chord like a, like a scale. And you would go to G. I introduce these arpeggios uh, when I teach the cage chord system, by the way. Here's F. And I could do the arpeggios in some different positions. I could do F up here. A different uh, form. So you can play arpeggios. So uh, one soloing technique is instead of just playing a scale, you would touch on the actual chord tones from the chords you're playing over. And that's one way you can connect your lead line more closely to the chords. So when I'm on A minor, I'm going to put emphasis on those notes that are part of the A minor chord. And I know where the notes of the A minor chord are because I've learned arpeggio patterns. And then when it goes to G, I know where the notes of G are. And when it goes to F, I know where the notes of F are because I've mapped out those arpeggio patterns. So I can play through the scale and I can kind of mix those. Who is an example of a guitar player that would do this? You, can, you hear this in almost everybody's playing. So I'll give you an example. In the guitar solo of Stairway to Heaven, Jimmy Page is using the A minor pentatonic. Except for what? He puts in an F note. That's not in the minor pentatonic scale. Well, where does that come from? Well, think about the chords he's playing over. He's playing over an F at that point. And so well, I don't know whether he thought about it. He mapped it on the fretboard. His ear led him. But he knew that this note is not in the scale. But boy, it sure would sound good to end that descending pentatonic on that note because you're on F. That's an example of chord tone soloing right there. Targeting a chord tone. Stairway to Heaven. You hear it in Stairway to Heaven. Um, another example could be Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd. It's in the key of D. There's an A in there. So it's like, you know... Uh, whoops. So that solo is actually using a D arpeggio. And then when the chord goes to A, you're playing... Essentially, an A arpeggio. So that is a perfect example of playing a lead line that is focusing on uh, chord tones. I could 
examine all kinds of famous guitar solos and find examples of where the lead lines are touching on chord, uh, uh, chord tones. So I go over this at length in Fretboard Theory Volume 2, give you a bunch of sample progressions, show you what scales you'd use, what arpeggios you would use, how you map those out, and how you put those together. Um, and um, you hear it in all sorts of things. And like I said earlier with Stairway to Heaven, uh, I'm not sure exactly how there's different ways that players can can arrive at this. Um, the way I show it in fretboard theory is is we we're very intentional about mapping those patterns out, seeing how they overlap, and using that as our guide. <clears throat> and that's certainly one way that um, guitar players uh, would uh, would do would use this technique. But I also suspect that. Um, some players get guided by their ear, particularly those who are really, really talented, you know, and, you know, music is just kind of, they're just like a receiver, and music just is beamed down from heaven, you know, into their brains somehow. <coughs> In that case, I think they might be following what they hear. Um, but uh, in either case, even if you're following your ear, you still have to map it out. You still have to think that, oh, if I'm going... <coughs> I'm going to end on F there. you got to map that out and, and work it out. So um, what's nice about fretboard theory, the system that I have, is that if you're not a player that would naturally hear something like that, um, you're not out of luck because I can introduce it to you. I can show you how it works on the fretboard, and then you can do it whether you hear it or not, and then you can experiment with options, and you can look at the way those patterns come together, and you can get all sorts of cool sounds. And uh, you'll hear them after you play them, but it's just great because uh, uh, I'm kind of half and half. You know, I have enough talent that some things come naturally to me, and sometimes I can hear things. But I'm no, uh, you know, I'm no musical genius, so I have to kind of study things and um, uh, work them out. So I'm kind of a combination of both. So I kind of, I kind of know a little bit. What it's what it's like on kind of uh, both sides, but what's what's really cool is that if there's something that doesn't come naturally to me, I can still map it out, figure it out, and it can still become a, become a part of my skill set, um, even though it would have never come naturally to me. You know, and I think that's where a lot of us are. We're 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 studying and we're learning because we know that um, we can take things much further with uh with the right information so okay we need to move on um kim says says my guitar skills are finally to the point of playing songs and working on the chord transitions in songs i am comfortable with the caged chord shapes and the pentatonic major and minor scales what would be the next step in addition to continuing to learn songs and working on soloing skills yeah, I think the next step is keep learning on, keep playing songs. I wouldn't focus on something in, in addition to that. There is so much you can do with open chords, power chords, bar chords. You mentioned that you also learned some of the cage chord forms, and you learned the, <clears throat> did you say pentatonic and major or just, or just uh, pentatonic? I think pentatonic, okay. If you never learned anything beyond, you know, those scales and those chord shapes, you could literally never run out of songs to play, and you could, I mean, you, you could never run out of things to do for the rest of your guitar life because those things are used, you know, over and over and over throughout popular music. So I would say spend some time learning as many songs as you can and refining all the skills that are involved with playing those songs that use the things that you, that you kind of already know. And uh, then, uh, I'm, I was, are, I'm assuming maybe you're a fretboard theory student because you're mentioning things that are in the, in the course. Um, then you can move on and you can take a look at some of, some of the other things. But um, don't get ahead of yourself. It sounds like you've already, you've already got Plenty of information in your head. Now you just need to work on application. Learn lots of songs. Because, you know, songs are going to introduce things. It, it's one thing to say, 
okay, I understand these chord shapes and I understand how they're used in this one song. But you could go learn a dozen songs that all use those same chord shapes and each song's going to be a little bit different. They might be in a different key. They might have a slightly different tempo, slightly different rhythm. So you have to learn a little bit different strum pattern. You know, you might uh, have to mute strings a little bit differently on each song. There could be lots of elements that make each song distinct <clears throat> and what makes you a good player is learning all of those, you know, different, all of those differences and all those different little, little skills in there. So yeah, keep working on songs. We are moving on. Steve asks, should you practice at least a set of scales every day? Uh, should you practice at least one set of scales, hyphen, say just one or two keys daily, every day, while you are working on songs in a, in a dedicated set like those you have made in the course? <clears throat> um, I'll answer that question after I take another drink. So the question was, should you practice scales every day? No, there's nothing you should do. Um, can you practice scales every day? Yeah, sure. You know, you, uh, you can. Um, I typically don't practice scales every day because I already know scales. So what do I need to practice them for? But if you're still in that learning stage where they're still kind of new to you, um, you, yeah, not a bad idea. Pentatonic scales are used all over popular music. So, um, you know, that, that, and I also like that playing scales is kind of a good warm up for your hand. So if you want to go through, you know, practice them every day. Use alternate picking. I'm going down, up, down, up in each string. Yeah, not a bad idea. You could also, you know, add some overdrive so that you actually increase string noise and then so you can work on your technique of keeping those strings quiet. do that you know playing a couple different keys just so you don't get used to the patterns being in specific uh, positions on the fretboard um, that's not a bad idea but you learn those scale patterns and you kind of map them out but then the next step and most important step is learn song so if I really want to practice you know E minor pentatonic may, I might review the patterns on the fretboard initially but then I'm gonna go through and play songs I'm gonna play Purple Haze, I'm going to play Voodoo Child, I'm going to play uh, Suzy Q, uh, Green River, um, Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. I'm going to play through those parts because then I'm not only playing the, the scales, but I'm actually using them musically. And there's always going to be more involved with that. You're going to have some hammer-ons, some slides, pull-offs. And so you're going to be using those techniques along with the scale. And those are the techniques that, sound, that make it sound... Um, musical. So that's what I would recommend um, uh, you do. And let's move on. Next question. George asks, what's the best way to learn to mix uh, major and minor pentatonic shapes and also apply them to the caged system? Uh, okay. Best way to learn major pentatonic shapes and also connect them to the cage system. So uh, in my fretboard theory series, in chapter two, I introduce the pentatonic patterns. Um, and then I get into all the details you need to know about how do you connect them, how do you practice them, how do you transpose, how do you pick them, how do you finger them, um, how do they get applied to music, what are some examples of how they get applied to music. So um, I go way beyond just simply saying, here's five pentatonic scale patterns, because you can Google that and find those on the internet for free. So I really get into the details of how you practice them. I give you, I show you how they're used in music so you have a, a, a familiar reference and you understand why you're learning them. And anyway, uh, in Fretboard Theory Chapter 3, I introduce the caged chord system. There's five main chord shapes that are used in the fretboard, and there's five pentatonic scale patterns. So in Chapter 4, is it Chapter 4? I show you how you could put those together. Um, so for example, if you're playing in uh, 
you know, if you're used playing a G like this in E form, well, you also have G major pentatonic pattern two right under your fingertips in that same position, right? Or if you're playing an A minor chord here at the fifth fret, well, you also have A minor pentatonic pattern one right under your fingertips in that same position. So I introduced that idea. And it's good to see how those things overlap and connect because that's one way that guitar players navigate the fretboard. That's one way that they um, can kind of jump into a key. You know, if someone's playing rhythm here and they want to jump into a, a scale to play a riff or a melody, um, you know, you, you could... Kind of the most obvious jumping off point would be whichever scale pattern is right under, underneath your fingertips in the same position. Right? Or if I'm playing, you know, G, a G chord, let's say I'm up here, and I wanted to fill with some pentatonic, well, I know immediately that I've got a little bit of pattern five here. Or I can slide into pattern two. So it's kind of good to see how they fit together because when you really start using the patterns and the chords together, you want to see that connection. That helps you, um, you know, just uh, fit the pieces together. So I introduced that to you in fretboard theory, and you can go through and follow the diagrams and my examples of how you can uh, review that. And then it's something that you get better at over time as you play more and more songs. And I like students to, whenever they learn a song, instead of just memorizing the tab, to take a moment and think about what they're doing and make those connections, right? So if you're, if you're learning the song Wind Cries Mary by Jimi Hendrix, for example, right? Instead of just memorize, memorizing that from the tab, I want a student to, to realize that this chord shape here is out of the a form in the cage system and I want them to know that this these chord forms are out of the G form I want them to see that and see how it relates see where those chord shapes come from and then I want them to see then that with this chord shape you also have that scale pattern or and that you use that when you do the so when you make those connections, then suddenly everything isn't just random notes that you're trying to memorize, but you see how things are working. And just think about over time as you learn more and more songs and your repertoire grows, the way you view the fretboard totally changes, right? If someone were in the key of F, you know, and someone said, hey, Desi, I'm jamming in the key of F. Give me a little something. Right? So I might pick up a guitar and say, okay, yeah, I'll jam, jam with you. And you might say, that's what I want to do. How, how did you know to just immediately jump to that position and start playing those licks? Well, because he was in the key of F. And so the first thing I thought of was, when cries Mary's in the key of F. And when cries Mary uses the F major pentatonic up in this position, so I'll just noodle in that position. That's how I was able to do that. So after you learn how scale patterns and chord shapes connect, work on songs and work on uh, understanding how that happens. In actual songs, we are moving on. Um, <clears throat> oh, wait a minute. This says the best way to learn to mix major and minor pentatonic shapes. I'm Maybe you're talking about mixing major and minor pentatonic to make like that blues sound like the I don't, is, if, that, if that's what you mean that's something different um, and that is something that I actually have a, a mini course a free mini course called soloing with mixed blues scales and uh, I will make a note to Say something about that in my next email. Moving on here. Okay, Ray says <clears throat> two things. He's looking for a good explanation on modes. 
what is a good acoustic amp for playing small venues? Okay, I got lots of questions on modes, and like I mentioned in part one of this Q&A, <clears throat> I have put together what is, without a doubt, the best instruction you can get on modes, and I know I sound like a pompous ass, but I'm being honest. I've been teaching for years. I know this really confuses people. I understand the concept. I break it down as simply as you can. I relate it to familiar songs. I talk about Santana and the Doors and the Grateful Dead, and I show you exactly how the modal concept work and which songs you would speci specifically hear different mo modal scales. I want to point out that modes uh, require you to first understand major scale patterns, how you harmonize the major scale to make triads and chords, and the number system. You have gotta learn that first. I teach that in in chap in fretboard theory chapters uh, five and six, and then in chapter eight I introduce modes. If you get the video version, I play through everything for you. I demonstrate it. I got lots of resources so you can listen to modal songs and play along and. That is the best way to, to learn modes. And if you don't think that it's the best way, I will refund your money. Nobody has asked for a refund uh, yet because probably the, uh, uh, one of the most common things I hear when I get feedback from people is that I have completely demystified the modes. They totally get it now and that their life has changed. Okay, the, and then the, ne the other question was, uh, what's a good acoustic guitar amp to play small venues? You know, I'm not sure. I'm not out doing that sort of thing right now. When I play live, I play through a PA system. So I know that Fishman uh, is a real popular manufacturer of like little acoustic combo amps where you can plug your microphone and your acoustic guitar and turn them up and they give you some nice EQ settings and some basic effects that you would use on a vocal mic and acoustic guitar. So you might want to look at that. Um, a lot of people, if they're playing acoustic guitar gigs, would just use a PA system, a small PA system with a small mixing board. Get a micro plug your microphone in there, add a little bit of reverb, maybe some delay. Um, plug your acoustic direct into the PA, add a little bit of reverb so it's not so dry. Um, if you want to put, if you want your acoustic guitar to go through um, a special acoustic DI box, direct input box that might have some extra features to make the acoustic guitar sound a little bit better. You could do that. But I played many, many gigs where it was just microphone and acoustic direct to PA. You know, the nice thing about a PA, <clears throat> you get your speakers up off the ground if you have stands so you can cover a room better than if you have a little combo amp that's down, you know, below your knees. That that does, in a lot of situations, that's Although it might sound good, it, it's difficult to project your sound a, across a, a room that way. Or, depending on the, the room that you're playing, it might be perfect and it might be all you need. Um, let's move on. Uh, Mark has a lot to say here. He says, I'd be very interested in your approach, suggestions to hammer-ons, pull-offs, string bends, and similar techniques. Is there, is there a right or wrong way to do these? I've watched you do it in the course videos, but I haven't yet been able to consistently apply it in my playing. Another aspect of playing that I'd like to hear more about is learning to play leads faster. Is there a recommended way to build speed? What is the relationship between one hand fingering and the other picking? What is the relationship between one hand fingering and the other hand picking when it comes to playing passages more quickly? Where does the speed come from? Hopefully that makes sense, yada, yada, yada. Mark, okay, <clears throat> let's talk about these. First of all, hammer-ons, pull-offs, bends, slides, that sort of thing. Um, those are techniques that you'll get introduced to as you begin learning riffs and solos uh, that use scale patterns. So after you learn the pentatonic scale patterns, you kind of map them out on the fretboard, and um, you get introduced to how you would, uh, you know, instead of picking every note, how you might hammer a finger down or pull a finger off, um, how you might bend up to a pitch, you know, or how you might slide to a pitch. And these are all, um, these are called articulations, and they, um, uh, they are what they affect the sound, they make your playing more, you know, expressive. Um, they also affect 
how comfortably you might play something. Sometimes it's easier to hammer on or pull off or slide than it is to try to pick every note. Sometimes you might prefer the sound um, when you use hammer-ons and pull-offs and you don't have that sharp picking attack on every note. It makes your playing sound more legato, which kind of, you know, smoother. It kind of gives it a, you know, as opposed to, right? That's legato, right? Sometimes you that legato sound might be what you want, what you're going for. Sometimes maybe you want to pick every every note. So um, the best way to develop these techniques is to allow yourself to get introduced to them in songs and then work on those song parts. So I'm not a big fan of playing an exercise of refining, trying to refine your playing through exercises. So instead of me you know, doing something like, you know, sitting around and doing this and trying to, I don't know, that just bores me. I want to practice doing that with, um, with a song part or something, right? So I might take, you know, Stairway to Heaven, and I would work it out where I would add those articulations in there. So I might go... Those are pull-offs. And maybe a slide, so. That's what I want to practice, so I would make that my exercise. And when I get, when I get that down, I actually have part of the Stairway to Heaven solo down. I don't know if that's the way Jimmy Page did it, but whatever. I'm just using that as um, uh, an example. So I get part of Stairway to Heaven down. I learn how to phrase musically in the scale in a way similar to, to Jimmy Page. Um, and that's just, for, I feel like that's a better way to practice. I, I like doing that. That's, uh, I enjoy that. Uh, I, I enjoy that more. So I like to use songs uh, to do that. Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd as a solo. With, with arti articulations in it. All right. Uh, I missed something, but get the idea. It's like, that's a good solo to learn because it introduces you to those techniques and uh, they're played very slowly. Um, I actually would teach that to my students on an electric guitar because um, it's much easier to bend strings on an electric. It's really tough on an acoustic, but you could start um, on an electric. So learn simple riffs, solos. Purple Haze, another, Purple Haze is another one. So I had some slides in there. And then later. Slides, ham runs, bends. You learn simple stuff like that and make that your exercise. And that way you know you are training yourself to play in the manner needed to perform popular music, right? You got to be real careful with exercises. One thing I learned over the years is that Many exercises have you doing things that you wouldn't normally do in music, you know? If you've ever seen picking exercises where they have you do something like... It's like... Or something like... Uh, hold on. Uh, ridiculous stuff, like you're playing Twister with your fingers. I've been playing guitar for decades. I have learned thousands of songs. I have performed thousands of gigs. I have never, ever, ever, ever had to do that to perform a song. So why would I want to practice that, right? While some guy is at home practicing some of these ridiculous exercises that he thinks he's going to make a better, that's going to make him a better guitar player, I actually spent time learning the songs and the techniques that made me a better guitar player, and I got the gig. Think about that. Okay. Um, was there something else I wanted to add here? So, oh, playing leads faster. So, yeah, speed is something that comes with time. Don't get ahead of yourself. 
if you can't play Wish You Were Here smoothly in time with the music, or Purple Haze, if you can't play simple riffs and simple slow solos smoothly in time with the music and pick accurately, then if you try to play something that's technically more demanding, and like it's faster, well, of course you're going to struggle. So you need to back up and you need to work on refining your skills and slowly work on things that would become uh, faster and uh, faster um, over time. Stairway to Heaven would be a good example. That's kind of more, that's definitely more at an intermediate level. So if I was having someone just beginning with riffs and solos, I wouldn't have them start with, st with Stairway to Heaven. That would be a good goal to work toward to kind of get to that next level. Um, so uh, that's the first thing. Do you want to learn how to play fast? Back up, learn how to play slow first, accurately, and then gradually over time, as you get more and more comfortable playing things, you'll be able to take things, you know, play things a little bit faster. Now, <clears throat> let's say you've already done that, and you're ready to move on, but you're, you're struggling with some things. <clears throat> Sometimes you need to uh, put more thought into how you're playing something. Are you trying to pick every note? And is that causing you to fumble at times? And if you left some pick strokes out and you replaced it with a hammer-on or a pull-off, could that smooth things out? Like Stairway, for example, right? <laughs> Right? Maybe you have trouble picking all of those notes and you keep fumbling over it, but you find that if you just p p put in some hammer-ons or pull-offs, all of a sudden now you have removed that little stumbling block and uh, so you can do that sort of thing. When you're picking, too, you can think about where are you stumbling and why are you stumbling. Um, stairway is a good example of this. If I start that descending line in Stairway... If I start it with a downstroke, then I got to come, my pick is down here below the strings and I got to lift it up and I got to come back to the second string with an upstroke. Same thing happens when I finish the second string and I got to come back to the third string with an upstroke and maybe that's what's causing you to, to stumble. Well, what if I start that descending line with an upstroke instead? If I do that, now my pick is up here in the air, and it can come right down on the second string, and I can continue. I finish the second string, and here it is right up in the air, and I can easily come down on the third string. So little stuff like that can make a difference, and maybe you're not thinking, thinking about that. Sometimes if you just plan out your picking a little bit, um, you can make things easier on your right hand. I talk about this in my program, Guitar Picking Mechanics. And I get into a lot more detail than that. So if, now before you run out and get guitar picking mechanics, it is for someone who is well beyond the basics, intermediate player, and you want to, you're in that intermediate to beginner advanced range. You have no trouble at all playing all kinds of songs, strumming chords, bar chords, playing, you know, some simple riffs and solos. You are well beyond that. You could go out and play in a band, but now you really want to refine your skills and put a lot more thought into things. If you're at that level uh, and you want to improve your picking, take a look at guitar picking mechanics. All right, we are moving on. Uh, Jonathan <clears throat> asks, what kind of physical warm-up exercises would you do, if any, before a gig or long practice session? And then he says, I have a physical pain sometimes in the thumb area that could possibly be carpal tunnel. It's just wondering if there are any stretches that help relieve stress uh, caused by the hands. Um, I never did any warm-up exercises. Um, I always just started playing. But I never jumped into anything that required me to be warmed up, you know. So, for example, if you're working on the guitar solo to Stairway, he Stairway to Heaven, that has, that's what you're working on right now. That's where you're at and you're playing. Um, and you're going to sit down and practice for a while. Maybe you don't want to jump in to that solo uh, right away, right? You might start at the beginning of the song and play through the first chords for a while 
Just get some blood moving to your fingers. All right, you might strum along a little bit. Maybe you put on a completely different song, you know? Maybe you, you whatever, you throw on a Neil Young song or something. You just strum along for a little bit. You're warming up your hands physically, you're getting some blood moving to them, but you're also kind of just warming up yourself musically. You're playing in time, you're turning on a recording, you're following the tempo, you're getting in the groove. You know, and after a song or two, then you're ready to start working on that solo, you know? Which is going to be more physically demanding, you know, on, on your hands. That's what I always did. And I was never a big fan of using some sort of exercise to warm up. I would just play music. I would just play some simple music to get um, warmed up. When I would play gigs, now I used to play a ton of gigs, um, I would usually always put uh, simple songs at the beginning of the set, songs that were the simple, in other words, I wouldn't start a song with Freebird, okay? Because I need to be really good and warmed up before I start doing the, you know. Uh. All those bends and stuff. Okay, I, don't, I wouldn't want to start a set that way. You know, just unloading my gear and getting started for the night. So, you know, I would start with songs that were uh, <clears throat> more easier to, play and also i was singing a lot at that time too i would never start with a song that would really uh, uh stretch me vocally as well i would just kind of warm up my voice with you know, i mean i used to do a lot of like uh you know bars and restaurants and boat clubs and that sort of thing so i would start with like a margaritaville Jimmy Buffett, great song to start with, easy strumming song, easy song to sing. There isn't a lot of, you know, range there. And then much later at night when I'm good and warmed up vocally and um, when my hands are warmed up, that's when I would start playing Roadhouse Blues by the Doors or something like that. So that that's how I always structured my warm-up. I've never been a big fan of uh, uh, exercises. If you like exercises, even the ones that I mentioned and criticized earlier, and you're like, yeah, I know they're silly, but they really do just kind of help get the blood moving to my fingers, and I enjoy them, and I do it before I play. Hey, if it works for you, then, you know, go for it. They never work for me. I just like to jump into a song. But um, And what was the next part of the question here? Uh, thumb pain. Yeah, I'm not a doctor. Who knows what could be causing uh, problems. Um, I'm very fortunate that for most of my guitar playing life, I never had any problems. But I'm getting older, and so in the last few years, I have developed uh, <clears throat> some issues with this hand in particular. Um, I, I've had some issues, and I think it actually mainly comes from all of the computer work I do and, and editing I do with the mouse and the clicking and swiping back and forth. Um, I have some problems. And I play a lot of bass, too, do a lot of bass gigs. And... Um, you know, being in this position and using the fingers like that, especially when I've been clicking on a mouse all day, has caused some issues uh, for me, um, unfortunately. And so I just have to, like, lay off the mouse for a while or lay off the bass playing. I prefer to play bass with my fingers, but sometimes i got to use a pick um, <clears throat> if I'm experiencing some cramping or something like that, which unfortunately has happened before. Uh, my left hand, every once in a while... I, I do have an issue. Um, you know, it's important that you find a playing position that's comfortable for you. Most people rest the guitar on the, on the right leg, but this can put the wrist in a really uncomfortable position at times. Imagine if you're trying to play, you know, like the police every breath you take. I mean, look at my wrist here. Okay, that's, that's really uncomfortable. So, you know, sometimes you want to put the guitar on the other leg much more comfortable for my uh, wrist here. Or you might use a strap and, you know, you can hang the guitar and angle the uh, uh, headstock and that can uh, alleviate some uh, stress on your <clears throat> hand. Um, you can also avoid things that are troublesome for you. Like this song. If you're, let's say you're trying to play this song by the police, which is qu quite a stretch. 
especially when you come down here, right? And let's say every time you go for that sort of fingering, you struggle, you stress, and you strain. Here's an easy fix. Don't play that song, okay? There's thousands of other songs you can play. So part of what makes each guitar player get good is them learning what they're good at and what they're not good at and playing to their strengths and avoiding their uh, weaknesses. Other than like st stretches, I've tried some different stretches. I've tried some different hand exerciser exercisers and stuff. Um, I, I didn't feel like anything really made, made a difference. Um, obviously if you've got cold hands, you know, you might just rub them together and play some simple songs for a little bit until you get some blood flowing to your hands. That makes a big difference. But in terms of like trying to do different exercises or use exercisers to, to try to solve problems, I, I, maybe it might work for some people. Hey, if you're, if you're someone who has had an issue with this and you did find a solution, I'd love it if you would comment below. Um, I don't really have much to, uh, to offer here other than I will be contacting a physical therapist here to see if there's something they can do to help me because I spend so much time on the mouse and I have had, uh, my problem has been kind of persist, persistent. It's not terrible, but it's been persistent for a long time now. And um, I wanted to see if perhaps someone could work on me and help relieve some of that, some of the issue I have. Anyway, let's, uh, let's see what people comment and, and if we can learn more about this. But for now, I feel your pain as I get up there in years. Um, it's, I'm having some issues myself. All right, we're moving on. This is another John, and he asks two questions. And he said that he got my guitar theory book, but then he realized, oh, I need to learn songs. I'm not ready for this. So his question is, well, when's a good time to get back into the guitar theory uh, book? Okay, um, <clears throat> You want to learn how to play songs using open chords, power chords, and bar chords. I actually put together a course that um, shows you how to do that, and I call it the Essential Skills Pack. Um, and I call it Essential Skills because it's skills that everybody needs to know. You don't have any business trying to learn guitar solos or trying to learn theory if you don't have essential skills that everyone needs to know to play songs. So... I would say if you can do that, then you're ready to kind of get into theory and explore the stuff that I would teach in like fretboard theory on that sort of thing. But until then, open chords, power chords, bar chords, learn how to play complete songs, strumming along with the songs and keeping in time with the music. Once you get past that, then you can move on to other things. And then the second part to this is how do pedals work when you play wirelessly? How do pedals how do pedals work um, when you play wirelessly? I'm not sure I understand what you mean, but I'll try to answer it anyway. I'm assuming you're talking about a, like stop box effects pedals. You take your guitar and you plug it into an overdrive and then into a delay pedal and then a reverb pedal and you go to your amp and then you can you have all these wonderful sounds. Well, if you're playing wirelessly, um, you're going to have the transmitter on your guitar, then you'll have the wireless receiver, and you come out of the wireless receiver into your pedals, into your amp, just like that. Um, so the wireless uh, transmitter and receiver is just taking the place of the actual uh, cable, if that's what you meant. So maybe, maybe you meant something else, and I'm, I'm missing it. But I'm going to move on. Uh, next question here is from Steve. He says, how can I learn to improvise over a song that I have learnt? Steve must be from the uh, UK, um, which I think is so cool. Isn't that neat that we can just, we got people from all over the world that uh, um, take my courses and send me questions, and I, I love that. I, I, I pointed that out because normally here in the U.S., we don't use the word learnt, um, but I like it. Um, so, for example... Um, if I'm playing around with the melody or the chord structure in between a verse and chorus, how can I learn to improvise over a song? So, <clears throat> um, 
improvisation is something that requires a vocabulary. I was talking about some of the differences in language. Let's talk about learning another language. And let's say that somebody asked, how can I learn how to just have a natural conversation with somebody in a different language that is, that is new to me? What do I need to do? You got to learn the language and then you have to build up a vocabulary of words in that language. And really more specifically, you have to learn phrases, right? You have to learn, you know, how, how are you today? And uh, um, which way to the bathroom, right? That, that sort of thing. You have to learn the, the phrases that are common to that language when you're, when you're carrying on a conversation with someone. And that, can, that would include, um, you know, whatever, cliches or what is it, whatever is, is common to that language. Music is exactly the same way. You know, you can learn scales and stuff like you learn the alphabet, but you got to learn how to make words. You got to learn how to make sentences. You got to learn how common phrases. Where do you learn those? By learning songs. When you study a language, you're often going to study dialogue. So it's like, here's an example of dialogue that would occur if somebody visited uh, you know, a coffee shop and they placed an order. Here's, here's an example, right? And so you study that dialogue and you see how people would, would converse. And the Music is exactly the same way. Whenever you learn songs, you see exactly how players would use a particular type of scale pattern to play a riff or to play a solo. You'd see the techniques, the articulations that would be involved uh, with that. And the more, you, the more examples that you learn, then the more vocabulary you have. And when you begin to improvise with your own playing, you're going to be drawing from that vocabulary, whether you're playing lead guitar or rhythm guitar. Right? The more the more rhythm guitar parts you learn, then you see how, well, okay, so um, maybe you learn a song and it and the song features, you know, some basic chords in the key of G, right? But you're like, well, I wanna I wanna add more variety to my playing and I wanna know how I can do something different. Well, you'll start thinking about songs that you played in the key of G that did something different. Oh, well, I once played a song in the key of G that went, you know, uh, so something like, you know, I don't know, I'm making <laughs> something up. But as you learn more and more songs and you see how people play different rhythm guitar parts around the fretboard, that's where you're gonna get ideas of how you can mix things up and add variety to your own playing. It all involves songs, so grow a big, repertoire and then take what you've learned from those songs and learn how to use those ideas over other things. All right. Hey, we are at the one hour mark here in Q&A part two, and I still have more questions to go. So I'm going to wrap this up right now, and then you can look out for Q&A part three. That will be released shortly. So just another reminder, if you're watching the video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, click like. You can leave some comments below uh, if this was helpful for you. If you um, have you know, some comments that would be helpful for viewers uh, related to the questions uh, that, um, that I received, go ahead and uh, uh, comment below. If you're listening to the podcast episode, um, you can rate my podcast wherever you're listening to it. And uh, if you have any feedback, you can email me, desi at guitarmusictheory.com. If you are not already on my email list and receiving emails from me, uh, you can subscribe just by going to my website, guitarmusictheory.com. I ask you a question about your playing, and I give you some different uh, answer options. Click on the one that best describes you, and you can get enrolled in a free course. Um, and then you'll autom automatically get added to my email list. So you'll get notified when I release a new podcast or video or blog post or I have some news to share or maybe a new course um, or something like that. So make sure you're on the um, email list. Make sure you get enrolled in one of the uh, uh, free courses. And stay tuned because I've got at least one more part to this Q&A that will be out shortly. I'm Desi Serna. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening.